Turn in our Bibles to the book of Revelation this morning. Revelation, the 16th chapter. Revelation 16, and our topic is ancient spiritualism and modern apostasy. Ancient spiritualism and modern apostasy. 16th chapter of Revelation is where we're going this morning. Revelation 16, beginning with verse 13. Revelation 16 and verse 13. Say amen when you have that. Amen. Revelation, the 16th chapter and verse 13. Is there a modern apostasy that we can't understand more clearly if we analyze and look at the word's testimony on ancient spiritualism? Does the Bible teach about ancient spiritualism? Amen. Okay, a few people understand that. There is much counsel in the Old Testament, in the beginning of the Bible, concerning Spiritualism. Some do not understand what spiritualism is. We're going to look at that today. When we look at the idea of spiritualism, the modern apostasy that we see today are based upon the ancient apostasies. And the ancient principles, the ancient teachings of spiritualism had a large role in a, the apostasy of Israel. Let's see in the book of Revelation chapter 16 that the Bible teaches that there would be a mighty, a, a tremendous movement of spiritualism in the last days and the extent to which this movement of spiritualism would affect the entire world. Revelation 16 is where we're going and verse 13. The Bible says this, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, now out of the mouth of the beast, now out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles. Go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. On our last uh, meeting together, we looked at this work, this message, and looked at even this great battle in another message dealing with the battle of Armageddon. Yet and still, we see that this gathering takes place and is being uh, accomplished way before even the plagues fall. This gathering, this pulling together of people to battle against God is done by miracle-working power. Verse 14 says, the spirits of devils, they go to who? Who's it saying? Verse 14. The kings of the earth and all the world. This takes place in the last days. This takes place with what we have looked at in previous studies as an ecumenical movement in the world as it were, but we want to see that this movement even has much to do with God's remnant church. The Bible says in the verse 14 and 13 that this would be a work in all the world. Some people doubt that this is a work that's going on in the church or that it would affect the church because it said that it would go to the kings of the earth and all the world. But brothers and sisters, could it be that we could be affected by the world and become like the world? Could it be? Could it be that this last day movement is going to affect largely God's people and sweep away many that don't have an anchor for their soul? Let's examine and see from the Word of God that what we see in Revelation is found also in the first part of the Bible. And then we look at this idea of spiritualism or the miracle working power of Satan's host and the teachings thereof. Because remember, they catch their prey. The frog catches his prey how? His tongue. These teachings and these miracles of spiritualism, these miracle working powers, we see them also in the beginning of the Bible. And these teachings anciently went to the kings of the earth, just as in the last days it said they'll go to the kings of the earth and all the world. Let's see that in the book of Exodus quickly. Exodus, let's turn to the book of Exodus now. Exodus, the seventh chapter. Let's see if these messages of spiritualism, the teaching of spiritualism, the miracles of spiritualism, deceive the ancient kings of the ancient world. Exodus 7 says this. Exodus 7 and verse 11. Look at what it says concerning Pharaoh in Egypt. In Exodus 7 and verse 11, let's see that this happened anciently it's a shadow of things to come. Exodus 7, are we there? Amen. Looking from Exodus 7, verse 11 through 13. Same if you have that. Amen. It says, Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers. Now the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. For they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod did what? swallowed up their rods and he hardened Pharaoh's heart that he hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. Brothers and sisters, when we look at the word of God, many have taught a priest on the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. What did the scripture show us was the instrument used to harden Pharaoh's heart? Magicians and sorcerers, let's be a little bit more clear. What's our topic? 
Spiritualism was used to harden Pharaoh's heart. Spiritualism was used to harden the heart of the nations, harden the heart of the leaders anciently against the word of God. Even we see in this text, for those taking notes, we see in this text that miracle working power to try and counterfeit the miracle working power of God. Because doesn't God say that there will be miracles that attend the gospel proclamation? Hearts transformed, the sick being healed, demons being released, all these miracles, who wants to counterfeit these things? Satan does. Just as the word of God shows that God sent his prophet to do miracles to confirm the power of God, these spiritualists, these magicians and sorcerers came in to try and counterfeit the work of God. Spiritualistic miracle. But what about the book of Daniel? Remember Daniel? Look at Daniel quickly. In Daniel we see also the same idea. We see it over and over again that these spiritistic powers try to influence the kings of the earth. Look at the book of Daniel now. Daniel chapter 2. Daniel 2 beginning with verse 2. In Daniel 2 notice how again we see that the nations even look to and rely upon these spiritistic teachers, the advisors of great kings anciently. The advisors of many world leaders today are what? Spiritualists. We read, for those that are old enough, looking for Daniel 2 and verse 2, we read in various newspapers in the 80s about Nancy Reagan. How many of you remember that? Nancy Reagan and her soothsayer, quote unquote, how even Jean Dixon visited the White House. You had personal uh, stargazers and personal uh, horoscope readers, personal spiritualists that would visit Nancy Reagan and tell her what things were to come, even things that were to give counsel to her husband. Who was her husband? Ronald Reagan, the president. Spiritualism. Later on in the 90s, we found out that Hillary Clinton had spiritualist and supposedly Eleanor Roosevelt appeared to her and spoke to her. You all forgot about that, right? At the highest levels, people are being influenced by spiritual. So if at the highest levels, what about if the kings of the earth are receiving these things, what about all the world? What about all the world? Look at the book of Daniel here. And Daniel we see this in ancient spiritualism because we'll see it according to Revelation 16 in the end. In Daniel 2 and verse 2 it says this, it says, then the king, let's begin in verse 1 for sake of, t of context. Verse 1. Daniel 2 and verse 1 says, in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar did what? Dreamed dreams. Dreamed dreams wherewith his spirit was troubled and his sleep break from him. Then the king commanded to call the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans for to show the king his dream. So they came and stood before the king. But sister, could it be? that God could be giving various world leaders right now dreams that outline prophecy. Could it be? Could it be that there are individuals that are over heads of state, kings of the earth, in various parts of the country, that are receiving dreams like this because why did Nebuchadnezzar receive this dream? Because the time was now full. The fullness of time had come. And God gave this world leader a dream that no spiritualist, no horoscope reader, no stargazer, no, no New Age channeler could understand because the dream departed from Nebuchadnezzar. He could not remember the dream. And guess what Satan cannot do? He can't read your mind. He can't go inside and see what you're thinking. He can try and divine and try to, by testing, see and find out what you're thinking, but he can't read the mind. That dream had broken from him and none of these soothsayers could understand this dream. But guess what? Daniel not only could find the source of the dream, amen, amen, but also Daniel had the ability to do what? To find the interpretation, because he knew the interpretations were with who? God. With God. Brothers and sisters, if someone, say Barack Obama, had a dream tonight about Daniel 2, and you just happen to be in D.C. doing a meeting at Howard University, and you see the, the, the big motorcade pass by and so on, and he stops at the same restaurant you're stopping. He wants to have some vegetarian food. Pulls inside there and so on. And you're sitting down there having a meal. You're having some, you know, some kale and maybe a sandwich there and so on. And, you know, he just happens to walk in and said, you know, hey, how you doing? And sees you reading 
or talking about a prophecy and he remembers the very same thing in his dream. And he said, you know what? I had that same dream. What does that mean? Could you do it? Could you explain it to him? Could you say, O king, live forever. The dream was your dream is this. You saw a head of gold. Arms, could you break down that dream? Could you break down Bible prophecy if you came in the situation where you were face to face with a world leader that was ready to hear the truth of this time? We're talking about ancient spiritualism and modern apostasy. The modern apostasy among us causes that people will see Barack Obama and say, can I have your autograph? They have no interest in trying to present the word of God or to be in a situation where they could be used of God to allow someone at the head of even a nation to receive the truth for this time. In Egypt and in Babylon, we see this scenario outlined because this will be repeated when? At the end of time. Not just the idea of people receiving dreams that God may be giving them, that they may be interpreted, prophetic dreams, by the people of God, but I'm speaking of people being influenced by spiritualism. Because what do these astrologers and soothsayers in the kingdom of Babylon want to do? Could they understand the dream? Did they know what the dream was? Absolutely not. They said, hey, king, you tell us the dream and we'll do what? Give interpretation. So what they, they wanted to give their own interpretation of God's message. Are, are, are the messages of God, the word of God, by private interpretation? Could the soothsayers that are not in contact with God or a knowledge of God give a correct interpretation? Because interpretations are only with, with God. So when we see even this king, this idea in Babylon, we're seeing even private interpretations come through spiritualism. We find many people believe they understand the word of God. You find that many people that are into spiritualism will quote scripture, but what they give, how they explain it? It'll be a private interpretation. When Jesus says, ye are gods, he see, he's saying that we actually are gods. Jesus said, the Bible says, ye are gods to whom the word of God came. In other words, those that have received the word of God and the truth and have understanding of prophecy, they, the Bible says, are as gods. Why? Because they not only know the word of God, can speak the word of God, but they know things to come. God says, you know I'm God because I can tell you things to come. I can speak and it is. That's a sign of divinity. So God called those who had received the word and received the word of prophecy gods, little g gods, because they had things similar to God. I wasn't saying that God was in us, per se, that we were God ourselves, like five percenters and other different spiritualistic teachers. teachers. We have to understand the word of God. So look at Daniel 2. In the book of Exodus, we see that kings of the earth anciently were influenced by spiritual. Can you say amen to that? But what about the people of God? What about his remnant church? What about the apple of his eye, the true church of God? Would they be among those that would also be influenced by these miracle working powers of the last days? Would they be included in this number? The Bible says the kings of the earth and all the world would be influenced. Would they be among that number? Look at the text that, that would cause us to maybe think that that could not be so. Look at the text in the book of Numbers. Numbers 23. In number 23, we see a scripture that will cause us to think that that could not be so. It could never happen, or it should not happen. In number 23, it says this. Number 23 and verse 8. You ever heard of the, the, the name Balaam before? Was Balaam a prophet of God? Well, Balaam actually was a true prophet originally. He was a true minister. He was an ordained seven-day minister. minister. He was recognized. You say he was recognized. Yeah, he was recognized. Did, did not Moses and them allow him in the camp? Didn't the patriarch and prophet tell us that they did not understand what he was actually doing because the things he was doing were at first secret? We're going to get to that in a moment. These, these apostles came in and have started and started to grow among them because at first they were what? Secret. They were done in secret. They were done privately. They were done just with the youth. And then when those youth become adults, then it starts to reap a bitter harvest. And we're seeing that today. Ancient spiritualism, modern apostasy. In the book of Numbers 23, let's see why most people would say it could not be referring to the church when it says all the world would also be deceived by these demons. In Numbers 23 and verse 9, it says this. Numbers 23, 9 says, from the tops of the rocks. Here's a prophecy of Balaam. From the tops of the rocks, I see him. Who's he speaking of? Israel. From the tops of the rocks, I see him. And from the hills, I behold him. Lo, the people shall dwell how? 
alone and shall not be reckoned among who is he speaking of here? Israel is not to be reckoned among the nations like Egypt, nations like Babylon, nations that were influenced and relied for counsel and guidance upon spiritualism. Nations that daily had newspapers filled with horoscopes and people daily looked at them. Nations that daily had various different messages and magazines and news programs where people got on there and started talking about how to find the God in you. How that, you know, you need to be the best you can be because all of us have a little bit of God in us. Are they talking about having the Spirit of God dwelling in us? Having the truth dwelling in us? Or is it trying to say that we are God? This is what was going on in Egypt and in Babylon and the Bible says that we were not to be reckoned among these things. We were not to be connected with these things. These people, the people of God, Israel, were to be separate from the nations. Do you believe that? How would they be separate? Because remember, Israel was one of many tribes of people that were upon the earth. How would they be separated? Wouldn't they be by the word? When God called Egypt and separated them from Egypt, from the house of bondage, how would they be separated? Just because they were not in Egypt? What's that? By the law of God, by the word of God. They were brought out of Egypt. They were brought out of the house of bondage, but also the word was to separate them. When God brought them out, it wasn't just the distance that caused them to be separated. It was heeding and understanding the word of God. Having the word of God and heeding it. Let's see that in the book of Numbers. I'm sorry, Deuteronomy now. In Deuteronomy, let's see how clearly God warned them of many things, but especially about spiritualism. Spiritualism. Spiritualism was one of the main warnings God gave to his church because he knew this would take place, this would be revised or, or reinstituted among them if they did not truly have a true experience with the gospel and a true understanding of the word. These two things were to protect them from going into all the deceptions of spiritual. Look what it says in Deuteronomy 18. Deuteronomy's 18th chapter. Deuteronomy 18, and we're reading for your notes verse 9 through 14. Deuteronomy 18, verses 9 through 14, because they were brought out of Egypt, but that wasn't enough. They were to go into the promised land, but that was not enough. There was to be counsel and wisdom so that when they entered into the promised land and they were among and in the, in the, in the, uh, in the arena or the area where these other nations dwelt, there was a work they were to do, not to assimilate and be like the nations in dress and diet and thinking and habits and entertainments. They were to be separate from the nation, not reckoned among these nations. There was a special work for them to do, and they were not to follow the habits, the patterns, the worship, the religion, the spiritualism of these other nations. In Deuteronomy 18, it says this. Deuteronomy 18, beginning with verse 9. Say amen if you have that. Deuteronomy 18 and verse 9 says, When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those. So can we also say that, that when we talk about spiritualism, spiritualism will be a part of false education? Let me repeat that. When I say that the idea of spiritualism being a part, a, a, a part of the curriculum for false education, the Bible just told us in verse 9, when thou come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not, what's the next word? Learn, Learn to do after the abominations of those nations. Many are studying the principles of New Age in various forms from the earliest stages all the way up. I saw in a news article just not recently where they are now instituting in kindergarten forms of yoga meditation and what they call centering. Teaching the children to black their minds out and to lay in these yoga poses and try to just make their mind all... Brothers and sisters, we see from the earliest stages people being educated and taught the teachings of, the nation, of these nations that God said he had cast out for their abominations. Among the abominations, spiritualism. Look what says going on. Verse 10. There shall not be found among you... Notice he gets clear now. Among you, anyone that maketh his son or daughter to pass through the fire. Was that a common practice in the ancient world? Where they had these various different false gods and they would actually offer their children on the altar or actually have them pass through uh, various different pits of fire to show if they were purified or not? 
many died inside those things. And this was a ancient practice in spiritualism. As a matter of fact, have you ever seen on the news or on various television shows how they have people say that they are fire walkers? These, all these things were the so-called miracles, the so-called practices in spiritualism, the so-called evidences of their power, passing through the fire. It goes on to say this, not only passing through the fire, but also that uses divination. What's divination? Or divining? Magic, to have an understanding of, of secret knowledge. God's knowledge, because divine is a word that means that which is holy, right? Divination, the understanding of the things of God or the things that are holy. Divination was not true divination, not prophetic power. It's talking about the spiritual teachings of saying that they understand the other worlds. The world of the dead, the world beyond, the world of the spirits. All these terms are used to say that they have some kind of secret knowledge. Isn't that what Satan said to Eve in the beginning? That God doth know in the day that you do so. In other words, God has this secret, the divine one had this secret knowledge. And if you partake of this, you will also know. God doth know, and you will know by transgressing the law of God. Di divining, understanding the knowledge of the holy. This is what we see here. But it's a false knowledge. Was Satan giving true knowledge? It's a false knowledge, a knowledge of good and evil. It says, or uses divination or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch. Now we know what an enchanter and a witch is. We're so familiar with the terms of spiritualism in our modern day, we don't have to ask what a witch is or enchanter, but what about an observer of times? Observant of times. What are times? Seasons, days, years, months. When you observe times, what does that mean? Observing times, there are various different times that were in, that we're going to see in a moment, in the heavens. That the spiritualists or the spiritual teachers would try and make something that could divine your life. In other words, they can understand what your life is going to be by the signs and seasons of the year. In other words, a certain part of the time of the year, you would have a month called April. And depending upon where you fall in that, uh, that time of April, you'd either be an Aries or you might be a Taurus. You might be in another month, you might be a Pisces or a Sagittarius, you might be a Capricorn. All these different terms are not just terms of different animals that someone came up with. They are connected with the study of spiritualism in the heavens and the stars. What we call astronomy, where you have all these various different so-called so animals and shapes and so on of stars. Those things were used for horoscopes. You ever heard the term horoscope before? You have a horoscope, and depending on when you were born, this is what you're going to be. And your whole life is going to be shaped by the teachings of these spiritualistic arts. People do not leave the house without reading their horoscope many times. They believe in their horoscopes. They say, you know what, I need to find a, a Sagittarius because Sagittarius and, 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 and my sign, we match. Brothers and sisters, Observer of times. Also, there were certain times that were observed by the ancients or the spiritualists that we even today take in. We observe various different days where the ancients would worship their God. Various days where there would be a time where they would observe black arts or black... Even sometimes when you have even the day of Christmas and so on. These days were worshipped in the ancient world, were they not? Many of these days, like Easter, worship in the ancient world, they were connected with spiritualism. And many people observed these times. Verse 11 says, as a charmer or a consulter with familiar spirit. That consulter also in our time says now channeler. Someone said they can find and talk to the various spirits. Oh, I can, I can bring up your dead mother. Bring up someone from the past. Bring up some great person. They can come and talk to you. I am a channel, they'll say, for the other world. I am a charmer, a consultant with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or necromancer. Verse 12, God says, for all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord your God does what? What did God do to all these other nations that, that were before the children of Israel? Because of these abominations. There are many abominations, but one of the main abominations that were done was the familiar spirit, was the practice of spiritualism. 
it says going on, the Lord does drive them out from before thee. Verse 13, thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God, for these nations which, that which, which, sorry, which thou shalt possess hearken to observer of times and unto diviners, but as for thee, the Lord thy God hath not suffered thee to do what? Hath not suffered thee to do so. Brothers and sisters, let me ask you a question. Do you notice that when we look at that last text as well as the, the tenth text, it talked about those that use divination or observe times? If you write down, note, write down the word use and observe. Use and observe. Because if I see a car driving by, what am I doing? Just observing it, right? If I get it inside there and turn the key and put that thing in park and drive off, what am I doing now? Using it. Some people say, you know what? You know, I'm glad I don't, I don't, you know, I'm not a spiritualist. I'm not into that. But guess what they do on, they observe it. On television, on Netflix, and all these, they're observing it. They love Harry Potter. They love Underworld. They love all these things about werewolves and vampires. They love a lie. So they're not necessarily even those that may actually use it in their mind, they say, but they are truly observers of these things. They are even in a passive sense learning, being educated in spiritualism. And just that small entryway, that doorway opens up to them a complete work that Satan can do. He just needs you to open the door a little bit because Satan will pry himself in and before you know it, you'll be more and more convinced of spiritualistic realities, quote-unquote realities, than divine things. The things of God will become more and more boring, more and more uh, out of harmony with, with what you really find. You find that these teachings are more pleasing to you, more in line with your thinking. Why? By beholding, we become changed. We like to think on these things, and these things, as we think on them and we behold them, it starts to influence your teaching. The things of God become less and less interesting to you. You find it very hard to read the Bible. These things happen as we entertain these thoughts. God said, don't entertain these thoughts. Don't even, don't even allow these teachings to come into your mind. Don't do as these other nations. By this way, they will not to be reckoned among the nations. But let's look at a text very quickly even to see exactly what happened after this warning was given. Did they heed this warning? Did God send them prophets over and over and over again to keep them and remind them of these things? Notice what it says now in the book of 2 Kings. Because again, we're talking about ancient spiritualism and modern apostasy. We're looking at how, according to 1 Corinthians 10, we're turning to the book of 2 Kings, 2 Kings, we're looking at how, according to 1 Corinthians 10, these things that happened anciently are in samples or examples to us who live at the end of the world. We're looking at things anciently in ancient spiritualism so that in this modern apostasy, we may not fall. How many can understand what we're looking at? This is a, a message to show us how we got to where we are as a church, as a body of people, as a last generation. We're looking for the book now of Second Kings. Second Kings, because did they hearken to the word of God? Did they hearken to this command and keep themselves pure? Keep themselves in harmony with God? Not learn and understand and be educated in the things of the new age, spiritualism? Second Kings says this, Second Kings chapter 17. Second Kings, the 17th chapter. And notice the word of God here. Second Kings 17. Second Kings 17. And for those taking notes, we're reading verses 13 through 19. 2 Kings 17, 13 through 19, and then reading ver, uh, verses 22 and 23. Let's read together. In 2 Kings 17, verses 17, sorry, 13 through 19, it says this. Notice how God not only gave them this warning anciently, but also he continually, daily, time after time, day after day, raised up prophets, sending them be time to warn Israel and to remind them of the present truth. But notice what it says. In 2 Kings 17 and verse 13, it says, Yet the Lord testified against who? Israel. Testified against Israel? And against what? Judah. Judah? By all the prophets. How many of the prophets? All. By all the prophets and by all the seers, 
saying, Turn ye from your evil ways, and keep my commandments and my statutes, according to all the law which I command your, commanded, past tense, your fathers, and which I sent to you by my servants, the prophets. What happened to the church? The church had now become divided. Even though it had to try to pretend that it had an air of being united and was organized, the church was really divided into two groups. Liberal group and a conservative group. It was divided. The unions wanted to go their way. The NAD wanted to go their way. The GC said it was powerless. We were trying to rely upon committees. This is what happened there. And God said what had happened? They had forgotten the words of the prophet. They rejected the prophet and the word given, the counsel given. They weren't keeping the commandments of God. And because of this, they were in a dire situation. They were in a terrible situation. They had rejected all the prophets, especially the last prophet that had been given to them to warn them of these things and to keep them in the love of God. But notice what it says going on. It says, verse 14, Notwithstanding, they would not hear, but hearken, sorry, hardened their necks like to the necks of their fathers that did not believe in the Lord their God. And they rejected his statutes and his covenant that he made with their fathers and his testimonies, sound familiar? And his testimonies, which he testified against them, and they followed vanity and became vain and went after the heathen. They went after the other nations. They started having their worship and their education system and their institutions just like the other denominations that were round about them concerning whom the Lord had charged them that they should not do like them. Come out of Babylon is our message, but educationally we want to go in. Come out of Babylon is our message, but as far as our health institutions, we want to go in. Come out of Babylon is our message, but when it comes to the actual worship that we're supposed to bring to the world, which is true worship, a return to true worship, a return away from Sunday worship to true worship, we want to do what? Go back in. We want to go back in. We want to pattern ourselves after the other nations. They became vain and went after the heathen that were round about them concerning whom the Lord had charged them that it should not do like unto them or like them. And they left all the commandments of the Lord their God and made them molten images even two calves and made a grove and worshiped all the hosts of heaven and served. This is what God's true church did. They worshiped all the hosts of heaven and served. What does it mean when you say worship all the hosts of heaven? Let's look at that. Hold your finger there. We're coming right back. Hold your finger there in the book of 2 Kings 17. And let's go to 2 Kings 23. You want to write this text down. Put it in your margin in pencil. You want to have this text. Every time you go to this text, you want to show what does it mean to worship the host of heaven? What was really happening in the church? What kind of worship actually was coming in by these new forms of evangelism, these new forms of worship, these new forms, a uh, new interpretation of Adventism? What was this? What was it really doing? In the book of 2 Kings 23, hold your finger in 2 Kings 17. Look at 2, 2 Kings 23 and verse 5. 2 Kings 23 and verse 5, what does it mean to worship all the hosts of heaven? In 2 Kings 23 and verse 5, it says this. Look at the definition of all the hosts of heaven. 2 Kings 23, 5 says, And he put down the idolatrous priests, I wonder if we have those today, whom the kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense in the high places, in the cities of Judah, and in the places round about Jerusalem, them also that burnt incense unto who? Baal, Baal to the sun and to the moon, and to the planets, and to all the hosts of What type of worship was coming in? And what kind of worship is Baal worship? Sun worship. What does it mean to worship all the hosts of heaven? Sun worship. What kind of worship was coming in among God's people and was being established? Sunday worship. Sunday worship. And guess what? You don't have to actually worship on Sunday to have Sunday style worship. You don't have to use Sunday as a day for worship yet to have Sunday for worship. All you have to do is observe Sunday type of worship, to learn Sunday type of worship. And out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. Your hands and your feet will have, be able to fight, not with God, but against God. These things happen anciently. We're going back to 2 Kings 17. We're not finished yet. 2 Kings 17. Let's read verse 16 again. We're reading around to verse 19. 2 Kings 17. Let's read verse 16 again. 
2 Kings 17 and verse 16. It said, And they left all the commandments of the Lord their God, and made them molten images, even two calves, and made a grove, and worshipped all the hosts of heaven, and served bed. Now these two idols could be a number of different things that we have left the Word of God for today. It could be a number of different things that we worship and we put in place of the Word of God, that we honor and we respect more than the Word of God. We don't want to take this sermon into a whole other veil, so I'll, I'll leave that for another sermon, what these two idols represent. But let's go on to verse 17. And they called their son, notice what we found in Deuteronomy, notice the warning in Deuteronomy, but it says here, and they called their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire. Sound familiar? And used divination and enchantments. And did what? sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. God brought them and brought them out of Egypt and what did they do? Sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Therefore was the Lord very angry with Israel and removed them out of his... What's going to eventually happen because of what's going on now? It says, Israel was removed out of his side. Isn't it amazing how we want to agree to a certain degree that all these things are examples to us except God pouring out judgment upon the church? We, we, will, we, will, we will entertain to a certain degree, a light degree, any and everything else but the fact that God will judge us for our works. Just like ancient Israel, we say, oh, the Lord will not cast off Israel. God will use us in this condition. God will use us in this rebellion. God will use us just as we are, without one plea. Verse 18, Therefore the Lord was very wroth with Israel and removed them out of his sight. There was none left but what? There was none left but the tribe of Judah. Because Israel had called a complete apostasy. Israel was the part of, of Israel, of, of the nation of Israel, if you will, that had all the majority of the people. They had the, you know, vault with the writings there, and they had, you know, the deed to all the different properties. They had the majority of the stake. They seemed to be the majority of the church, and Judah was like a little group that, you know, were conservative, a little group that, you know, they weren't as powerful, but they thought themselves to be also the holders of prison truth because they were conservative. But guess what it says here? Verse 19 says, And also Judah kept not the commandments of the Lord their God, but walked in the statutes of Israel, which they had... May. What did it say? It said not only did they apostatize and remove themselves from the commandments of God, but they walked in the statutes that Israel had made. In other words, Israel had a church manual, and they said, well, you know what, I can serve the Lord, but I, you know, I want to be in harmony with the brethren. I need to follow this policy. I want to follow NAD policy. I want to follow the church manual. I want to follow what the, the church mandates by statute because Israel has made statutes, and I need to do what the organized church says. So in conservatism, they still were not spiritual. They, st they still were not spiritual, as I say. And they were able to bring in spiritualism through the desire to be like Israel. Can we see that? Drop down to verse 22 and verse 23. In verse 22 and verse 23 of 2 Kings 17, it says, For the Lord, or for the children of Israel, walked in all the sins of who? Who is Jeroboam? Who was Jeroboam to, to Israel? Who was Jeroboam to the church of God? He was the leader of the church. He was the leader of the union, leader of the conference, leader of the division, leader of the world field, if you will. Jeroboam, it says, verse 22, for the children of Israel walked in all the sins of Jeroboam, which he did. So all the children of Israel, all the congregation, the unions, the divisions, the churches, the various theaters and fields and mission, they all followed the leader of the church. The leader of the church set the standard. And he brought in a new type of worship. They gathered the youth together and had various conventions and means to try and train these young pastors in new forms of evangelism. For the children of Israel, verse 22, walked in all the sins of Jeroboam, which he did. They departed not from them until the Lord removed Israel out of his sight. In other words, they did not have any idea or desire to turn around. They're not going to be turned around. 
they're going to follow this new pattern, this new revival, this new idea, this questions on doctrine interpretation of the three hundred message of the Great Amen Movement. This was going to be a pattern of moving in this direction and not being removed from it until God judges the church. Verse 23 says, until the Lord removed Israel out of his sight, as he had said by all his servants, the prophets, so Israel was carried away out of their own land to Assyria unto this day. What's Assyria? Babylon. It's Babylon. Until spiritual Babylon raised itself up and were used as an instrument to afflict the people of God. Do we see a pattern there? Do we see that these things that we see today with, you know, spiritual formation, centering prayer, you know, all these various different forms of spiritual formation and this one movement, the one project, all these new interpretations that we see, all these calls for a new form of prayer, a new way of praying, a new way of, of looking at prayer, a new way of looking at, at studying the scriptures, a new way of, of meditating on God's word. You ever hear these terms? They're pervasive. And how are these things becoming so open? Well, let's look at something very quickly. Let's look at something. Look at 2 Kings. 2 Kings. We're still in 2 Kings, aren't we? 2 Kings 17. And let's begin in verse 7. How did this come, become so open? You're wondering. Some people are saying, where did this come from? How is it that everywhere we see everyone in various parts of the country, even in various parts of the world, saying the same thing? How, it just seemed like it just exploded. How did it get to the, the point where it's just the way it is now? What happened? We, we quote unquote, say we didn't see it coming, didn't we? It was prophesied, wasn't it? But look what it says in 2 Kings 17. 2 Kings 17, verse 7 through 9. Are we there? For it was so, oh, sorry, so, so far, for so it was, I should say, that the children of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, which had brought them up by the land of Egypt, from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and had feared other gods, and walked in the statutes of the heathen, whom the Lord cast out from before the children of Israel, and the kings of Israel, which they had made. Look at verse 9. And the children of Israel did did secretly those things which were not right against the Lord their God, and they built them high places in all their churches, all their conferences, there's always a place in every city, every part, every conference, every division has a church that's the real, lively church. Where they don't mind if you speak in tongues there. They don't mind if you shout and, and run around. They don't mind if you, if you really get excited in worship. They don't mind if you want to cut a, a step or two here and there. They don't mind. It says, they built them high places in all the cities from the tower of the watchmen to the fenced cities. From the tower of the watchmen? Now, now did you miss, miss that? It started secretly. Did you see that? Okay, I'm going to give you a second to write because I see some of you writing. You want to write this down. How did it start? Secretly. secretly. And when they started secretly, it says they started to build these high places. Did God establish high places for his worship? No. no. His worship was not to be on steps. All his worship, look at the sanctuary, everything is upon the ground. They're not to go up by steps to worship God. The, the heathen had temples with steps and also in the mountains of worship in the high places. The Bible says that the children of Israel started putting these high places in how many cities? All. Every city. The purpose was to try and cause all the churches to accept the celebration movement. All the churches to accept this new idea of prayer, this new idea of meditating. They wanted all the church to turn the lights down, have people close their eyes and, and imagine things or not think of anything, to close, to blank their mind of all thoughts, quote unquote, and let the spirit come in. What spirit comes in when you blank out your mind of all thoughts? And see, this is, this is becoming pervasive. But notice what was the substitution here. Look at the text. In verse 9 of 2 Kings 17, let's read it again. And the children of Israel did secretly those things that were not right against the Lord their God, and they built them high places of all, in all their cities, from the tower of the watchmen to the fence cities. Did you, you understand what that means? When they, when they took the watchtower, if you will, the watchman's place, 
and the fenced cities and replace these things and put high places there. In other words, the watchtower, the, where the watchman was, were where true messengers were to give messages and warning to warn Israel when danger was coming. Oh, we don't need to have that. We don't need any more evangelists. We don't need to have the, all these books and teaching these people these things. No, we'll, we'll remove this from our curriculum. We'll remove this from the church and we'll replace it with high places. We will replace true gospel preaching and true prophetic warning. We will replace that with, you know, sermons like them dogs. Sermons like, you know, you know, I got shoes and you got shoes. All these first day sermons, all these ideas of worship are replaced. The watchman is replaced. And what kind of what cities? The fence city. What kind of fence city? The fence or the wall was the protection of Israel. The true messengers would be removed and substituted with messengers bringing in worship and praise and worship. The, the protection of Israel would be not thought of being important, but we don't need these walls of defense. We don't need all these, these various pillar truths that give us a wall of defense. We don't need the commandments of God anymore. Let's preach the love of God. Let's preach about, you know, fellowship. Let's preach about, you know, doing good works. Let's preach about loving our neighbor, loving our enemies. Let's preach about having more money. Let's do a financial seminar. Let's do these things. Let's bring in more music and more entertainments and let this be the predominant thing. We don't need watchmen giving us warnings. We don't need fence cities defending us. We don't need that anymore. Let's replace it with high places. But how did it come about? Spiritualism. The book Great Controversy tells us that now in our day, spiritualism is more seemingly in the church than out of the church. And how is it that the religion of our day, she says, is becoming more and more like spiritualism? Because the church is conforming to the world. The principle of spiritualism we find everywhere. I, I, I would admonish you to go back and look at the sermon, Five Signs of Spiritualism in the Church. Right there on YouTube. Five Signs of Spiritualism in the Church. It goes through the great controversies outlined of five major clear signs of spiritualism in the church. But we're looking at how this ancient Spiritualism we're looking at today led to what we see in the modern apostasy. We see it all outlined here before us. And how did it start? Secretly. Secretly. It started with the leaders. But how did it start with the leaders? Secretly. Starting to have meetings and trying to change the curriculum, removing things secretly, not openly, removing things secretly. Removing spirit of prophecy classes, removing even watchmen in these institutions of higher learning and moving them out and replacing them with other individuals to give a new message secretly. It seems subtle, this, this plan of attack until we see the fruit thereof, until we see questions of doctrine printed with no author anywhere in the book written down there. Until not only is it written but also we see, especially in the last 10 years, it being republished and sent out to a greater degree. Where is this coming from? Is it an organized plan of attack? What's happening? It started first with the leaders like Jeroboam, and it started first how? Secretly. Is it a secret now? No. no. We, have reaped, we have sown the wind, and now we're now reaping the whirlwind. Now we see it everywhere. Do we not? Look at a few texts here as we, we come to a close. Look at the book of Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles. We talked about it being first with the leaders, or coming from the leaders, the preachers, right? Notice what it says in 2 Chronicles. Let's see another text. 2 Chronicles, chapter 33. As we wind this message down. 2 Chronicles 33. 2 Chronicles, what chapter are we looking for? 33. 2 Chronicles 33, reading verses 1 through 6. Did the leaders lead the people away from the Word of God? Did they lead them away from the teachings of God, from the spirit of prophecy? Again, we're talking about this secretly. How were they led away? They were led away from the Bible and the spirit of prophecy secretly, point by point, and it was slowly, secretly, point by point, replaced with these spiritualistic concepts. Even the whole idea that the spirit of prophecy is a source of inspiration for the church. Isn't the word inspiration used over and over again by people that are spiritualists? I mean, Oprah loves that word, inspiration. It's not a rating of the word inspiration, mind you. However, Spiritists love the idea that individuals are inspirational. And what do we say about Ellen White now? Isn't it strange how we now call, they say she's a source of inspiration to the church? 
source of inspiration, huh? Inspiration? A source of inspiration? Or that she has the gift of inspiration? She's inspired. Again, Second Chronicles 33 and verse 1. Notice how the leaders led the people away from the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy and into what? Spiritualism. And how did it happen? We saw chapter 17 of Kings says it was secretly. Verse 1 says Manasseh. We know Manasseh, do we not? Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 50 and 5 years in Jerusalem. But did that which was what? Even in the sight of the Lord, like unto the abominations of the heathen, whom the Lord had cast out before the church. See, God always takes you back. You know how God always takes you in these scriptures back to something he said before? You have to study, brothers and sisters. He said that this was the abomination that he had told them about before, for that the fathers dealt with. Verse 3. For he built again the high places which Hezekiah, his father, had done what? Broken down. In other words, here you have individuals that come up and try and fight back the apostasy. And someone comes in and builds it back up. Some people say, oh, well, Ted Wilson is fighting apostasy. Let's see if he lasts past 215. Let's see when he gets kicked out in 2015, who comes in. And let's see when Manasseh comes, what's going to happen to all those places that supposedly he, he put down whatever he supposedly put down. It says, Hezekiah broke those things down. Manasseh built them back up. He said, and he reared up altars for Balaam. He made centers of worship for the three in his message. No, for this false worship, even this Sunday worship. And made groves and worship all, there it is, all the hosts of heaven and served them. Sunday worship came in through Manasseh. Sunday style worship. People say, well, I thank God we're not keeping Sunday, brothers and sisters. We're not keeping Sunday yet. But the Sunday style worship is already here. We're in the time where we're observing the time. We're not using them yet. We're just observing the times. This is where we are. And this type of worship is everywhere. The singing. The, the, the jazz chords, the R&B chords, the drumming, the use of, of flutes and whistles, and I mean, I'm talking about police whistles in the church. Verse 4, he also built altars in the house of the Lord, whereof the Lord had said in Jerusalem, shall be my name forever. And he built altars for all the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. And he called the children, or his children, to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Himon. Also he observed times, and used enchantments, and used witchcraft, and dealt with familiar spirits, and with wizards. He wrought much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to... Now, I just read that text and I've provoked some people to anger already. Some people read that and they become angry that you would even insinuate, even though it says right here, in God's church, among God's people, these things were done by the leaders. The leaders pr pr practiced and used divination and witchcraft. You say, how dare you accuse the leaders or any leader in the seminary church or any church of practicing, brothers and sisters, is the word of God true? Is there anything new under the sun? Is there any reason for all the spiritual teaching that we see? How could it be all around and not be practiced by someone? How could it be so clearly and openly taught now and then start secretly with people teaching these things anciently? Maybe in small groups, among pastors, in their universities. Eventually got, got to be curriculums, bringing in books of a new order. For instance, we see Manasseh as an example. Manasseh practiced spiritualism while he still was the leader of the church. We look at 1 Chronicles 10, right? You know 1 Chronicles 10. Remember Saul? Remember what it said about Saul when he died? Saul, in the corner of 1 Chronicles 10, it said that he died because of his seeking after familiar spirits. Remember he went to the witch of Endor, who, who claimed to bring up Samuel? What does that mean? Not only do we see Sunday worship with Manasseh, with Saul we see the state of the dead believing, even though this person is a leader in God's remnant church, believing the dead can speak to us? Brothers and sisters, do you know that people actually go to 
clairvoyants, quote unquote, psychics, because they can't find the child ran away from home and they wonder where he is and they want to have someone bring them back from the grave if they're dead or, or they want to talk to their dead loved ones. This is happening. People are being deceived by these things. It says, it's in Chronicles, that, that Saul's sin was going and seeking after familiar spirits. How did he do it? He went to seek after someone he knew was dead. Wasn't Saul dead? Did that witch actually bring up actually Saul? I'm sorry, Samuel, pardon me. Did he actually bring up Samuel? Now, everyone believed that Samuel was a man of God, right? Yeah. Now, if, now we're not going to go into all that. We want to go back and spend time. We don't want to close this out. But if Samuel truly was a man of God, and this was the truth that he was being brought up, would Samuel come up out of the ground? Because, uh, people, yeah, people think, oh, you're up in heaven, right? No. People say, oh, well, yeah, he came out of the ground because he was in the grave. He wasn't buried there. How are you coming up to the ground there when he was buried all the way in Jerusalem? He, he wasn't even in, they weren't even in Jerusalem. The Bible says that this, this spirit that came up had on a mantle. Right? Did Samuel still have that mantle? Remember, when Samuel refused to worship with Saul, Saul grabbed that mantle and it would ripped off of him. Remember that? And Samuel turned and said, just as you have separated this mantle from me, so the kingdom of God separated from you and walked off. He didn't have that mantle on anymore. That mantle had been taken off. He didn't die with that mantle. It probably still was in Saul's hand. It had been removed from him. So how is he coming up out of the ground with a mantle on? It's a deception of Satan. It's a familiar spirit. And Saul was deceived. Why? Because he had rejected the counsel and the spirit of prophecy. And because God will only speak through his word, especially to those that are out of the hand of God, he tried to use Urim and all kinds of dreams, and God would not talk to him, so he went to a new age. He went to a clear, he went to a psychic to try and find out the things of God. And because of that, he was able to believe now that the dead still were alive. Can you believe that, brothers and sisters? Can you believe it? Can you believe it happened anciently? Can you believe it's happening among us today? And it's going to continue in greater and greater force. Balaam died, according to the book of um, Joshua 13, jo Balaam died a soothsayer. Once a true prophet of God gave prophecies, even showed a prophecy of concerning the star showing the birth of Christ. But how did he die? Preachers, leaders, all seduced by what? Seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Let's close out with these last three texts. Isaiah 2. Isaiah 2. Brothers and sisters, if you're hearing... Strange interpretation. Isaiah 2. Strange interpretation. New interpretations of prayer. You need to run for your life. People are telling you that you need to, to have a new way of receiving the Spirit. Or you need to pray to the Holy Spirit. You need to run for your life. Someone tells you you need to have a, a new idea of, of, of understanding what Jesus is all about. You need to imagine in your mind's eye these things. Don't, worry, don't read in the Bible. You want to imagine these things. Now, brothers and sisters, the Holy Spirit will call you to see as you read things in the Word of God. But this whole idea of imaging and trying to look into basically fantasy about what might be, rather than resting upon the Word of God, allows Satan now to come in and use and abuse the mind. We're to cast down imaginations and every higher thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. The knowledge of God is found in the Word of God. Imaginations that are in harmony with the Word of God or based upon reading the Word of God, amen. But when we have imagination that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, or out of harmony with the principles God has said, God said not to, when God says to meditate on His Word, do you say imagine? Make fairy tale ideas of what it meant? Did God say to pray to the Holy Spirit? You don't find that anywhere. All the, the forms of Eastern and even Western spiritualism are now among us. Now, all, all the principles of Ignatius Loyola's secret exercises. You know what Ignatius Loyola is, right? The founder of the Jesuit order. His principle of secret exercises, his secret exercises for meditation and bringing the mind under subjection to the will, he claimed, which is really a demon, these exercises are among us. But they're not called that. They're called other things. We have centering prayer and all these. The same things you see in the Catholic Church as a form of, of, of creating a more and deeper spirituality, we see these things embraced 
among us. When you hear these things, you need to run for your life. Why? Because Isaiah says this. Isaiah 2. Isaiah 2 and verse 5 and 6. Isaiah 2, verse 5 and 6. You need to run for your life, brothers and sisters. You need to do what the man of God did leaving Simon and Gomorrah. What did Lot do? He tried to gather his family and flee for their lives. Flee to another city. Flee to the wilderness. Brothers and sisters, we must see the danger of spiritualism. This thing happened secretly and suddenly, and now we see it in full bloom. And what shall we do? Just pray about it like Joshua did? Lay in our face all night while in the midst of the camp there's a bomb. Brothers and sisters, we can't do that. We need to get up and meet it. In second, second, Isaiah 2 says this. Isaiah 2, verse 5 and 6. Isaiah 2, 5 says, O house of Jacob, come ye, and let us do what? Walk in the light of the Lord. Therefore, thou hast forsaken the, thy people, the house of Jacob. So they didn't walk in the light of the Lord. That, therefore, thou hast forsaken the, thy people, the house of Jacob, because they be replenished, that means influenced, from the east, and are soothsayers like the Philistines. And they please themselves in the children of strangers. They're pleased with the sermons and seminars and talks from these individuals that are teaching spiritualism under the name of Christianity. What kind of spiritualism? Sunday, horoscopes. I mean, you have so-called Christian horoscopes. And brothers, let me not even get into how even with children, especially in these so-called Christian entertainments, we have all these so-called entertainments Veggie tales and all these various things. But sister, you know these things are teaching spiritualism? Can broccoli talk? Carrots? You see, Disney has animals talking, so they have, you know, vegetarian apostasy now. They have broccoli and carrots talking and so on. But it's still teaching the wine of Babylon. But it seems cute, right? It's entertaining. In every form, in every medium, in every way, Satan is trying to capture the mind. The Bible says the children of Israel were replenished or influenced from the east, from eastern philosophies. They were like and pleased themselves with the teaching, the education, the methods of the world. This is why God forsook his people. This is why God's people were cast off. That's why they went to captivity for these things. Shall it not be the same in these last days? First Timothy says this. Two last texts. First Timothy. First Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy 4, again in line with Revelation 16, shows that this is a message for the last days. Ancient spiritualism and modern apostasy. 1 Timothy 4 and verse 1 says, 1 Timothy 4, 1 says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. Then the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of death. Brothers and sisters, this is not some, some, some arbitrary, contrived message to try and bring something out that's not actually there. The scriptures show what happened anciently in Israel and 1 Corinthians 10 tells us clearly there are examples and examples for us that we would not fall similarly. Also in closing, we claim to believe that we're in the sealing time. Don't we claim to believe that? And when we look at Ezekiel, does Ezekiel talk about the sealing in the ninth chapter of Ezekiel? Before the sealing work is completed, what is the condition of the church What's the condition of the leader of the church that leads to God having to seal his people and cast off all the rest, even into the place? What is the condition? Do we see leaders secretly practicing abominations? Look at Ezekiel 8 as we close. For instance, we, we, claim, we at one time believed this, but guess what? We have sold ourselves to do evil. And some have their eyes blinded and they will not or desire not to wake up before it's too late. Brothers and sisters, we need to understand the work God would have us to do in escaping from spiritualism in all forms. Ezekiel 8 is where we're closing. Ezekiel 8, reading verse 8 through 18 as we close. Ezekiel 8, verses 8 through 18. Say amen when you have that. Amen. Ezekiel 8 and verse 8, it says this, reading verse 8 through 18. It says, Then said he unto me, Son of man, dig now in the wall, Remember those walls that were replaced, the fenced cities that were replaced with high places? He said, dig through them. And when I had digged in the wall, behold, a door. And he said unto me, go in and behold the wicked abominations 
that they what? Now, brothers and sisters, this wicked abomination, was this wicked abomination in the open? You see, when you look at Ezekiel 8, Ezekiel 8 gives the idea that this is not something that at the beginning is open because it's behind a wall and it's behind a door. And is that door easily seen? No, he had to dig through the wall. And when he digged through the wall or behind the wall, he found this door. In, this wall was, was, was hidden, was it not? It was not easily to see. Verse 9. And he said unto me, Go in and behold the wicked abomination they do here. So I went in and saw, and behold, every form of creeping things, and abominable beasts, and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the walls round about. Remember how in Revelation 18 it talks about all these abominations in Babylon? These things are going to try to come in among us. All these abominations that we saw in Deuteronomy, 2 Kings 17, all these abominations which included what? Spiritualism would be in and among us. It says, verse 11, And there stood before them, beholding, observing these, even using these abominations, 70 men of the ancients of the house of Israel. And in the midst of them stood Jezaniah, the son of Shaphan, with every man his censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. So they were using and being observers of these things while they still did what? Ministered the censer in God's house. Then he said unto me, Son of man, verse 12, Hast thou not seen what, in the, what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the open? Do in the dark every man in the chambers of his imagery? There's the word imagery again. For they say, The Lord seeth us not. The Lord hath forsaken the earth. He said unto me, Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. You remember what it goes on to say, right? It goes on to say that they were found with their back to the temple, and they worshipped the sun to where? Didn't Isaiah say that they were re rejected or forsaken because they are influenced by the east? Or influenced by the sun? Influenced by Sunday words, influenced by all the spiritual teachings we see flooding among us. And who shall give the trumpet a certain sound? Who shall warn us of these things? Where are the watchmen that have been replaced with high places? Where is the fortified cities of defense and teachings that have been replaced with high places? Who will give a certain message last day and tell people to run for their lives, to guard and, and protect the children? The Bible says in the book of of uh, Exodus that in the time of Israel when they were trying to be brought out God instituted a Passover now are we to keep Passover today? absolutely not we don't keep feast days those feasts are a shadow of things to come but the principles that we see in there are timely and instructive to us why is that? because when the God of heaven was about to send his angel through to seal the righteous that had the sign and destroy the wicked what were the people of God to do in this time of danger? Remember, spiritualists were at the head of the nation, and spiritualism was rife, and God was trying to bring his truth in. And the people of God were in a situation where God was bringing the death angel through, and he was going to see that sign upon the house, and pass over, or you can see no sign he was going to destroy. There was a ceiling going on. The Passover at the same time, and what were the people of God to do? They were to flee into their homes. I'm not getting this. They were to flee into their homes and shut the door with their families around this slain lamb and partake of the lamb in their homes. Partake of the bitter herb in their homes. And how do they partake? With their shoes on and their loins girded and their staff in their hand because God was soon going to deliver them and bring them out. You won't be worshiping in your home for too long. God's about to bring us out. You won't be worshiping, you know, just by yourself, with just your family, just those that were able to partake. Of, you won't be doing it for too long. Because soon he that shall come will come and shall not tarry. Brothers and sisters, we are in a time where you need to protect your family. Gather your family into your homes if need be to escape from these abominations of spiritualism because ancient spiritualism has been now manifested in modern apostasy. Let's pray together. Father, strengthen our hearts and minds to see the enormity of this situation as it is and not to be deceived by false prophets wolves 
in sheep's clothing. Leaders and preachers and individuals that are leading out in teaching that would bring these false concepts in among God's people. Just as anciently, secretly at first, but then in the reaping time, the harvest time, bearing a bitter harvest. Help us to see the need of taking a stand for truth, taking a stand, even protecting our families from hearing and being observers of these things. Many are going into church and observing false worship and music, observing false messages, and beholding daily, beholding weekly, they're becoming changed. They're dying spiritually, and they're not seeing the danger. Awake up your people, dear God. Cause them to gather themselves in with Christ into the place of safety, to allow that seal to be placed upon their doorposts and on the two side posts and prepare to meet their God. For all these blessings, dear God, even they escape from spiritualism, we ask, we pray and we believe in Jesus' name.